Então... Welcome, viewers, to episode 69, the last one for the year 2014. This is the ForensicWeek.com show, brought to you by Forensic uh, IQ, Inc. I'm your host, Tom Moriello, CEO of Forensic IQ and professor at the University of Maryland Department of Criminal Justice in College Park, Maryland. Tonight, getting a foothold on forensic podiatry. Yes, viewers, forensic podiatry. Now, podiatry is the branch of medicine devoted to the study of the diagnosis, medical, and surgical treatment of disorders of the foot, ankle, and lower extremities. Forensic podiatry is the application of this medical to show the association of an individual with the crime scene and answer any other legal question concerned with the foot or foot. Now, those of you who say, well, we've been uh, looking at a collecting uh, shoe prints and, and footprints at crime scenes for a long time. What's the difference? Well, let's not confuse. When we talk about footprints in a more traditional sense, we're talking about the minutiae that is similar to um, what we find, uh, the, the ridges on hands and, and fingers. And certainly, if we have a footprint where we can see the minutiae and have enough of the minutiae to make an identification, sure, uh, that is a type of print evidence. Or a shoe, an actual shoe. If we get the sole of the shoe at a crime scene, we can examine the shoe, and, and that is considered a tool mark type of evidence. But we're going way beyond that. A forensic podiatrist is looking at um, the, uh, the the foot itself and what it does to the shoe, and uh, the the way the person walks and how that characterizes him or her uh, differently than others. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you are interested in this area, if you are a, a crime scene investigator and wanting to learn something new or different, please stand by. Our guests this evening are from across the pond in the United Kingdom. I am so honored to introduce our first guest, Dr. Wesley Vernon. Uh, Dr. Vernon is head of podiatry at Sheffield Primary in Community Services, which is Sheffield Teaching Hospital. He's professor at Huddersfield University and visiting professor at Stafford Shire University. He's a fellow of the Chartered Society of Forensic Sciences. He's a distinguished member of the International Association of Identification, IAI, and chair of the Forensic Podiatry Subcommittee of the IAI. In fact, uh, the reason why Dr. Uh, Vernon is here this evening is because we had the president of the IAI, Steve uh, Johnson, uh, on the show a few weeks ago, and he introduced us to forensic podiatry, and he said, you got to have Dr. Vernon on, and we're honored this evening to do that. Uh, Dr. Vernon also has an extensive forensic podiatry casework experience since 1995, has regularly presented worldwide, and has authored or co-authored over 60 uh, journal articles has contributed to forensic textbooks, including co-authoring the first textbook on forensic podiatry in 2011, entitled Forensic Podiatry, Principles and Methods, with his co-author John uh, DiMaggio. And in, 19, in 2009, was made an officer of the Order of the British Empire for Services to Medicine in Healthcare. Dr. Vernon, thank you so much for coming. I know we had some difficulty with technology, but we're glad to have you on the show this afternoon. Thanks very much, Tom. It's a pleasure. <clears throat> and, and also thank you for inviting uh, your colleague, uh, Jeremy uh, Walker, who's also with us. Uh, Jeremy is the Deputy Head of Podiatry Services in Sheffield Teaching Hospitals, also a member of the Chartered Society of Forensic Sciences. In 2014, he was appointed as Assessor for Gate Analysis for the Chartered Society 
of forensic sciences. Those of you in America who uh, may not be familiar with the word assessor, that is uh, an academic uh, practitioner. And if I'm wrong, I'm sure Jeremy will tell me later on. Uh, he's a member of the IA also in the Forensic Podiatry Subcommittee, involved with forensic podiatry casework since 2000. Jeremy, thank you very much. I know you, you had to drive over to uh, meet the doctor. And uh, I really appreciate the both of you being here. No, that's, that's fine. In a, in a moment, we will be uh, talking with our guests and, and introducing the topic. Uh, let me introduce um, the FriendsWeek.com student uh, uh, crew, which is one today. Uh, we're, 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 we're in the middle of, of uh, a finals week here, but we do have uh, Jamal Francis, who is producing our show today, who is a University of Maryland undergraduate in sociology. Jamal, thank you. Are you finished with your finals yet? Not yet. I still got one more on Saturday, and then I'm done. Okay. As soon as you're done here, get back to the books and keep studying. <laughs> Folks, you are watching ForensicWeek.com, a talk show that features real forensic science by real forensic scientists, educators, law enforcement, and legal professionals who find, collect, and examine forensic evidence in the performance of their duties. Broadcast live right here on your desktop and mobile devices <laughs> bi-weekly on Thursday evenings at our normal time, which is 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But today, we are doing it at 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, which is 7 p.m. over there in uh, uh, England. We are a proud member of the Hangout10.com live TV webcast network, which is a series of shows brought to you live the Google King service. Jamal, please tell our visitors how to ask questions, make comments, and keep watching. Thanks, Tom. All right, hi, everyone, and thank you for watching ForensicWeek.com. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas for future shows, please email us at ForensicWeek at gmail.com. If you are, in fact, watching this show live and you have a question for our guest, you can use the comment box below, and we'll bring that up on air. You can also find us on Facebook by searching the ForensicWeek.com show. Like and share our page. Back to you, Tom. Very good. Thank you. Okay, let me start with you, Dr. Vernon. Um, uh, again, a lot of our listeners are students who are brand new to the forensic community, but more importantly, our practitioners um, who are, uh, need to understand uh, the different types of evidence and types of information that can be obtained. So can you kind of give us uh, an understanding, a distinction between forensic podiatry as a type of evidence analysis and then between that and more traditional uh, common type evidence dealing with shoe prints and uh, footprints? Okay, forensic podiatry and the work of the forensic footwear examiners or the forensic marks examiners as we have, as we have over here in the UK are entirely different disciplines um, with an entirely different basis. Um, whereas the forensic footwear examiners or marks examiners uh, will deal with manufacturing characteristics of the, um, of the footwear, uh, will deal with features of accidental damage of the footwear, uh, the forensic podiatrist is more concerned with the, the wear features and the uh, issues around ha how the foot is fitted uh, the usual uh, wearer. So we're very much concerned with the way, uh, with the relationship between the foot and the shoe, how the foot's influenced the shoe and vice versa. Uh, the footwear examiners, um, the traditional footwear examiners are concerned with manufacturing details and um, accidental characteristics. Dr. Vernon, when when we look at a shoe print at a crime scene, and I know my students, and I know when my when when I'm teaching my students and they're doing exercises in the lab, uh, they're constantly wanting to circle large wear marks on the uh, from the shoe that are on the shoe print. And I generally said, well, you know, you only can you can only can wear certain parts of the shoes in so many different places. General wear marks, like in the ball of the shoe, or are those important at all? The general, uh, um, I mean, the general wear marks of the outsole of the shoe. Um, this was something I studied for my PhD work. Um, and w for our purposes, we defined um, uh, 21 different uh, parts of the outsole from which each component of wear would be spreading. So that's something that we would be concerned with. 
However, our involvement is more, um, it's usually the forensic marks or footwear examiner that's involved in looking at the association between the shoe and the scene of crime. Um, our involvement usually comes when there's a second aspect of the work to be done, looking into the associations between the possible wearer of the shoe and the shoe itself. So do you literally have to rip open the shoe to examine, yeah, you're examining on the inside, both the bottom and the top of the shoe? Yes, we're, we're interested in the wear features of the shoe in its entirety. So um, the way the outsole is worn uh, would be of interest. Uh, the foot impression inside the shoe on the insole or sock liner uh, we're very interested in. Um, we would also be interested in um, impressions and wear features um, um, within the upper of the shoe and any distortions, crease lines uh, or, or blem uh, um, uh, uh, outside the upper of the shoe to show how um, how the function has amended that. <clears throat> Very good. Jeremy, um, looking at your background, you've, uh, you've, you've got some area of specialization in the area of of uh, forensic gate analysis. Uh, now, I want to make sure I understand. When I think of a gate, it's it's the way a person walks. Is that correct? Yes, it's um, you know generally the way a person walks or runs. Um, particularly in the forensic gate analysis, we're using the way people walk because that's more stable than running. Um, so it's yes, yeah, it's using CCTV footage from a crime that shows the perpetrator walking you know, whilst entering or leaving a scene or walking away um, and that's used to compare to foot, you know, known footage of suspects walking that's you know, captured when they're taken to custody suites or through covert surveillance footage and comparing the features of, uh, of gate, you know, the way the person walks in the question footage and the reference footage. You know, um, I in the last couple of years, I had an interesting homicide arson case where the main evidence that the prosecution had for my client was this person get, coming out of a stairwell and walking uh, th through a, um, a lobby of a of an apartment building uh, when there was a, and a fire up on the tenth floor. What so happens? Not only was there a fire, but there was a dead body up there, and mm -hmm. they uh, they tried to say that this person running away from the they called it the scene. Yet the crime scene was ten floors up, and he and they got him leaving, um, uh, going across the lobby. Uh, my client earlier that night was with the victim of the homicide, and he happened to be wearing the same exact coat. No question about it. But the bottom line is. There was an argument over whether it was him or not, and uh, certainly everybody kept saying, "Well, it doesn't look like him." A forensic anthropologist said that the the facial characteristics are different, uh, but they said, "Yeah, but the coat and the shirt are the same." And uh, then we, uh, after it was all over, and by the way, our client was uh, found not guilty, um, uh, and I think rightfully so, but. Rightfully so, because there wasn't enough evidence, in my opinion, to prove beyond a reasonable doubt, which is this standard we have here in the United States by a bunch of people we call a jury, 12 people who aren't smart enough to get out of jury duty, uh, which is a, 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 a system over here that I'm not crazy over. But anyways, <laughs> later on, we, we looked at 3D laser uh, scanning. This is after it was all done. And I had, and because laser scanning was relatively new, and we used that technology to show that the guy coming out of the stairwell was five foot five, and my client was six foot four. So yeah. if somebody had used that technology at the beginning of this, it might have saved a lot of time and money and effort, etc. So now I'm learning from you, gentlemen, that mm -hmm. uh, this consideration of looking at as the person's walking, how much unknown footage of a person walking do you need to identify a a pattern or an individual characteristic of the person's gait? Um, I don't think there's any standard fixed amount to say you would need this amount of footage. Um, there's a lot of variations in the footage in the quality of footage, the frame rate um, of the footage, um, you know the viewing angle etc that affects the quality of it so as the other 
components that you need to consider get poorer, then you would need more footage um, in order to get a a um, you know a reasonable understanding. But typically, you want to see you know several steps in in view. Um, the based on the research, there's understanding that it's something like the sixth or seventh step um, of a sequence that somebody would be getting into their normal stride. So you need to mm. understand that this is somebody that has started walking. They are just walking now with their normal gait cycle and that's been established in order to uh, undertake an analysis. Okay, very good. All right, let's go into the different categories uh, of the scope of forensic uh, <laughs> podiatry. Um, the, uh, in the kinds of things you look at. One of the things in, in reading um, several articles that both you gentlemen uh, wrote, uh, I learned about uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the medical record of an individual about, you know, diagnosis of their feet, etc. This is something that you look at when you're looking at, uh, let's say you have a you have the name of a suspect. You you have a person who you believe may have been involved in leaving something behind at the crime scene. Um, what are you looking at when you're looking at their medical records concerning some type of issues or disease or medical condition of a foot? Yeah, the the use of uh, pedantry records in identification it's usually to do with um, um, helping identify dead people, and the sort of features we're interested in uh, that podiatrists would have um, recorded in the notes would be uh, the foot type of the um, of the person, um, any pathological features you know at a gross level, um, an intermediate level, even minor pathological features and then we will be considering the um, um, the lesions of uh, affecting the nails or the skin of the foot at the same time and podiatrists keep quite um, quite fine levels of, um, of, of very accurate detail um, of this information and that's the type of information we would use um, in that attempt to identify the dead person from our records. Uh, generally are people's uh, the length and width of their feet generally the same left to right? Uh, there's variation in 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 people's foot length. It's something that causes a real problem in the uh, in the shoe fitting trade, um, where they've got to try and balance um, 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 regularly balance um, together the need to fit shoes to a single person who has a different uh, left and right foot length um, and width. So variation in length and width of the human foot is uh, is quite normal. Okay. Um. Uh, and by the way, uh, Jeremy or either one of you, if, if we're on a subject and you have something to say, don't wait for me to ask for you. Please just uh, speak up. Um, uh, bare, bare footprint analysis and identification. So let's learn a little bit more. Now, again, we've already mentioned the fact that uh, there are um, uh, uh, prints, uh, the uh, minutia uh, that are, that are on hands and fingers are the same on the feet and you can identify them if you have a certain uh, standard numbers of, of points of identification. We, uh, we, putting that aside, uh, when you're looking um, at um, bare footprints at a crime scene or uh, on an object or whatever the case may be, uh, besides the, uh, some of the things we've talked about, what other things that are you looking at in reference to the actual print, etc.? Well, first of all, if there was ridge detail apparent in the print, it wouldn't um, come under the specialty of forensic podiatry. That would be passed to you know, experts in ridge detail analysis, you know, the fingerprinting experts. And sometimes mm -hmm. there's, there's um, members of, of that specialty who specialize in looking at a print when it's a uh, ridge detail from a foot rather than from a, a finger or hand. So if there's ridge detail apparent, it goes down that route. It's when there's no ridge detail apparent in the bare foot footprint that it comes down the forensic podiatry route, and we <coughs> use the overall size, you know, the you know the dimensions of the of the bare footprint and the shape of the bare footprint in order to compare question footprints at crime scenes mm. with known footprints that we collect off suspects. 
Yeah, and on top of that, we, we'd uh, we'd building um, um, features that have meaning to podiatrists. So uh, we would be very interested in the toe formulae, for example, and, and that basically refers to the order that you would meet the toes if you're approaching the foot uh, from um, um, distally from the from the far end. We'd build in any uh, pathological features that may be obvious to us in in the uh, in in the footprint that we're examining. And as, as Jeremy said, um, rigid details often missing from these uh, prints. For example, if someone was uh, the print had been made from someone wearing a sock, uh, you can't possibly use the rigid detail under those circumstances. And that's the type of uh, what we would call bare footprint that we may be you know, brought in to give an opinion of. That's same. That's the same as uh, when they wear gloves. Uh, when the burglar uses gloves and doesn't leave any fingerprints. Although, now, there are some types of gloves, like surgical gloves, if they wear them, they're tight enough on the skin that you can actually get the ridge deal coming right through. And I would imagine, depending on what kind of socks, they might get the same way. I, I noticed in your article that uh, you wrote for the International Association for, uh, for Identification called Forensic Podiatry, Role and Scope of Practice. And both of you are uh, um, co-authors of this. It was back in April of 2009. You, you talk about foot types. Uh, and uh, these Latin terms, pes cav covers, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. What what are those? Um, <laughs> right, uh, yeah. Try and put this in very simple terms. A pes cavus foot uh, would be would be a foot with an extremely high arch. Um, that's also characterized by um, the toes of the foot would also so be pulled to, back. Yeah. You know, so mm. trying to use my hand as a foot instead of being in a normal position. You know, the, the foot has a, a very high arch in it, and the toes are often yeah. retracted back, clawed back as well. Um, um, the forefoot tends to be lower than the, the heel with the foot of that type. It's quite an extreme type. If you have a, a suspect, if you have shoes, can you look at the interior of the shoe and identify the, the possible foot type of the person who generally wore those shoes? We could indeed. I mean, it very, very much depend on the foot type, uh, but something like a Pez Cavus foot, um, it would be a relatively easy task for us to, um, to eventually reach the conclusion that, um, that the marks and wear features in this shoe have been created by somebody with Pez Cavus. I know when I was running uh, in my younger days, uh, um, I used to buy expensive shoes in. Um, you know, they would check to see whether I ran on the inside of my shoes or the outside of my shoes, and, and they would create a shoe that allowed my foot to, I guess, become more naturally comfortable uh, when running. Um, do pe are there a lot of specialty, uh, special shoes out there? Or, or if somebody didn't buy a pair of special shoes and had uh, a certain type foot, uh, are you saying that after they wear the shoe for a while, they actually make an impression inside the shoe that reflects kind of what um, Jeremy was doing with with this and this, etc.? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that's, uh, you know, that's absolutely yes. right. You notice, yeah. <laughs> you, you notice I'm not a technical person here, okay, with, in this yeah. subject. But yeah. this is... This is really uh, this is really fascinating to me, and I'll tell you why it's fascinating. Because I've been in this business for over 40 years. You know, a police officer, an agent with the government for 30 years. I've been teaching um, forensic science for 37 years, and at no time did I, and maybe this is my fault, uh, have I come across um, the opportunity to learn from someone like you. Uh, and, and my concern is, and the reason why you're on the show tonight, uh, or this afternoon uh, for some of us, um, is that uh, <coughs> investigators need to understand the potential out there, uh, yeah. you know, uh, which, uh, which causes me to ask you, are the police calling for your uh, assistance uh, enough? Uh, when, do you, when does anybody decide it's important to possibly call um, a podiatrist or a forensic podiatrist in, in an investigation. I mean, this this has has been an issue, um, and it's all to do with the need to raise awareness. Now, on 
about three occasions each year I, I go to the College of Policing in the UK uh, and teach the uh, trainee footwear examiners what we do so they get an awareness of the sort of work we do so if they happen to come across it um, you know as a very related discipline uh, during their work um, rather than um, not realizing that something might have meaning and might be usable in the Im investigations they'll think ah hang on a minute we did this workshop with the forensic podiatrist there might be something in this so that's uh, helped to raise yeah. awareness yeah I think, um, yeah the, the main awareness area there would be our role in helping out when there's a questioned wearer of the shoe so when the you know the footwear examiners and marks examiners have linked an item of footwear with a crime scene but then the suspect denies being the wearer or mm. says they're the wearer of the shoes but somebody else was wearing them at the time of the crime you know, there's that further bit of work to do to try and establish somebody as the wearer yeah. of shoes linked to crimes and traditionally in the in the UK they've, they've attempted to to establish that through DNA by swabbing you know the footwear for for DNA and trying to get a DNA profile out of the footwear but um, that hasn't, yeah. you know, frequently hasn't yielded useful results. Yeah. Um, so is making aware, raising awareness that yeah. a forensic podiatrist could use the impression on the yeah. insole to comment yeah. on the association of a yeah. person with the footwear, rather than just the DNA route. Yeah. And one of the senior trainers at the College of Policing caught on to this, which is why he started inviting us onto that course to show what we do. Um, and 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 it gets very good feedback, doesn't it, on the uh, the course up there? Um, it's also it also crops up. There was a police force we did some work for not too long ago, um, and and that helped their understanding. And at the end of that, uh, um, uh, the conclusion was they need to have uh, a meeting quite urgently uh, because there was a consideration. They were so pleased with the work that had been done, uh, they were considering um, whether they should. Uh, use that you know each and every time um, CCTV evidence came up for example so there's a gradually increase in awareness and certainly in our unit in Sheffield if we go back to 1995 we were then getting perhaps one or two requests a year uh, to assist in case work uh, we get anywhere between three and five requests a week nowadays so awareness wow. is, uh, is increasing and that's just in our unit in Sheffield now, uh, the whole idea of forensic podiatry, from what I understand, uh, kind of uh, grew uh, up in England and Canada. Is that correct? Uh, it Were you the is. first ones to really engage? Yeah, the very first case was Dr. Norman Gunn in Canada in 1971, I believe it was. Um, and uh, Norm proceeded to work um, quite extensively in forensic podiatry. I think our involvement in the UK really started um, out of an interest of, in research in this area. Um, about 1989, wasn't yes. it? I did the, the yeah. first study. Um, you know, I like to test things through research first. You know, can this be done? Um, you know, ask questions around it, and um, and that that was our particular approach. So Norman Gunn was the very first, 1971. Uh, um, Dr. John DiMaggio in, in, in the US uh, started in the very early 1990s doing case work and around about that time we were doing research in the UK. Dr. DiMaggio, um, where is he? He's in the United States you said? He's in the United States. He was based in Phoenix for a long time and uh, now he's moved up to Oregon. Mm. So uh, what is your opinion uh, in the United States? Is there is there much use uh, of your assistance uh, in, Amer in America? I mean, there's the same potential that there is um, everywhere else. I mean, we, you know, we've also done a number of cases in, in countries such as Australia, um, in continental Europe, um, and there are some podiatrists working fairly regularly in casework in, in the United States, but um, I suppose you know a much bigger country. It hasn't um, it hasn't taken off to quite the same extent as it has in the UK yet. But we're a small, compact country. We almost all know each other. In. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize it was that small. All right, no, I, no, let fine. me. Uh, um, I'm looking at my notes, and there was a term also called fo um, footprint sequencing. Could you tell me what that means? 
Yes. Uh, do you want to do? No, do you want me to do that? Yeah. Uh, the footprint sequencing really is considering sequences of footprints that may have been left at uh, crime scenes, and as podiatrists, we're, we're interested in the analysis of people's step, stride, uh, base, and angle of gait. So the step um, being uh, uh, the distance between um, 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 right and left. Um, um, steps on each side, a stride being the distance between the step on the right to the next step on the right. Base of gait is to do with the, uh, the essentially the, the, the width between the left and right prints as they landed on the floor and the base of gait, uh, uh, the angle of gait would be to do with the angle of those feet as they've, uh, as they've landed on the floor. So it's possible to um, uh, to consider these sequences of prints um, if the person who left them had some sort of um, problem and, and, and comment on what that problem uh, may have been. I have an interesting question um, and I'm not sure if it focuses on, on gait analysis or foot analysis. Uh, in the event that you have a pr shoe print in some type of soft earth, sand, whatever, is there any way that you can determine the weight of the person who caused that print to be placed into a soft soil um, or whatever the, the surface may be. Is that possible? Um, from our perspective, there's been some very limited research to look at the effects of weight on the bare footprint itself. Um, but I really mean very limited research and it does show some promise that's worthy of further investigation but at the moment from our perspective there is nothing um, uh, nothing conclusive shown, um, shown yet. In fact I did go to a meeting earlier this week where we we're actually talking about um, that there is no real correlation that, that, that we're aware of yet between a person's actual weight and and um, the effect that might have on the footprint. Some people sort of walk in a very heavily footed way with a lot more pressure going through the feet. Other people can be quite heavy and walk in a light footed manner. So there's a lot of research waiting to be done there, mm -hmm. um, but nothing from our perspective that's 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 shown any such relationship yet. And also, we wouldn't have expertise in knowing how you know different soil types or sand, etc., you know, distorted mm -hmm. with relative weight. You know, Wesley was mentioning about the research there. That would be when there's a, a print left on a hard surface, and whether the print left on the hard surface gives you any understanding of that. Uh, you know, the the person who left the footprint's body mass. Um, Wesley says, you know, I think he's already commented on that, uh, but it wouldn't be an area that we had special, any uh, specialist knowledge in to estimate uh, weight from, uh, you know, the depth of an impression or size of an impression. Well, it's interesting because my mother always told me ever since I was a little kid that I, I walked too hard on my feet. You know, you're wearing out your shoes because you walk too hard, uh, yeah. and I put a lot of I put a lot of pressure, extra pressure down. I'm actually when I'm walking, I'm forcing my feet down on the surface for whatever yeah. reason. So when when talking to um, cobblers, the you know the profession that do footwear repairs in the UK, I don't know if you have you know cobblers over, over in the uh, in the states. Um, they said, you know, that they don't notice much correlation between, you know, it's big heavy people that wear the shoes out faster than small light people. You know, they think there's, you know, there's, there's far more variation into how and why a shoe wears and the rate it wears than uh, than, than body mass. I, I, I got to tell you why I asked the question about the weight. When I, growing up, there was a TV show called The Andy Griffith Show. I don't know if you <laughs> see that. Did you see that in England? The Andy, uh, Mayberry, you know, uh, Andy Griffith in Barney Fife. I have seen that. Yeah. <laughs> have you seen that? Uh, well, anyway. No, I've not seen it, but yeah. I've heard of it. Yeah. But let, let me tell you. Okay, so Andy Griffith and in, in, um, in his deputy, Barney Fife, you know, they were in a little town of Mayberry, supposed to be North Carolina, you know, small town, and they're the only law enforcement in town. Anyway, somebody was stealing cattle, uh, individual uh, uh, heads of cattle, one at a time, and they were trying to look at the crime scene. And when they went to the crime scene, um, they saw three sets of prints. They're looking, you know, they're looking, and they found three shoe I mean three sets of of shoes look like men's shoes 
three people uh, three people going in three people going um uh, they were never going in they were always going out i'm sorry yeah. and so the state police came in and took over the investigation and said looked at it, he says i'm going to tell you right now this this first person this person is no more than 110 pounds these two other people are very big they're about 300 close to 300 pounds each well at the end of the show one guy who was about 100 pounds would put shoes on the ca head of cattle and walk it out uh, oh. when he was stealing it. <laughs> the second and third guy, you know, put it together with about 600 pound head of cow. Uh, and, I, and it's funny because people see that show, by the way, is on all the time, even today. And mm -hmm. people watch that show and all of a sudden they assume that you can tell that. You know, because it's something they watch. And the people who think that are people who become jurors in our criminal justice system. Right. You know, we've all, we all hear about, you know, the CSI effect. But yeah. I truly believe that, you know, subconsciously, uh, juries uh, just assume that the police or the investigators or the scientists didn't do their job. Um, because they, in the back of their mind, they think all these wonderful things uh, can happen. But I anyway, I agree with you, Tom. I'm sorry to cut you off, but I just got to yeah. mention it because I feel like, I mean, it's, it's what people see on TV. You know what I mean? Especially when you're watching CSI and that type of thing, you see, you know, they have one button gadgets to do these amazing things. So it's understandable. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back. Uh, what I'd like each one of you to do, um, so our, our viewers can get an appreciation for success. We all have successes. Could each one of you kind of talk to us, talk to us a little bit about a case you did where uh, your evaluation was either the smoking gun or something significant to help um, the trier of facts in your in your courtroom um, decide um, on a on a uh, on a verdict. Michael Clark case? Yeah, do you want yeah. to go first? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, there was um, one particular case that we dealt with over here, and um, um, it was a bare footprint issue. And it, it, in this um, in this particular uh, instance, um, uh, the young man involved had called the police, uh, claiming to have found his parents dead when he uh, he got home from a music concert one evening. Um, his parents had been stabbed to death quite expertly, and he was an expert um, knife fighter. He was quite skilled in a screamer, um, and his parents had been killed very expertly indeed. So, so they the became quite suspicious at an early stage, and they'd found a bare footprint um, at the scene um, that um, uh, that the knew belonged to the perpetrator. So, they got in touch with. Um, with our service to see if we could help uh, consider whether there was an association between this young man and uh, the bare footprint found at the crime scene. Um, initially we tried to advise the police didn't how to collect bare footprints themselves but um, um, they weren't too confident about that and asked if we'd come along and collect them for us and then do the subsequent analysis. And in the uh, comparison between um, the exemplar bare footprints collected from the young man and the um, the footprint at the crime scene um, th they were very closely matched indeed in, in terms of the outline shape of the prints, uh, the features we were looking at and the actual physical size. Um, so we were able to come in, in, in our terminology to a conclusion that there was um, moderately strong support for the proposition that the exemplar print and the uh, question print had come from the same person. Now there was a lot of circumstantial evidence in that particular case but I believe that was the only um, example of physical evidence that they had to use and um, on the production of this report they didn't use a defence report in that case uh, but the young man was asked um, um, asked to, uh, for his comments uh, in court and at that point he admitted that it was his bare footprint on, on, on the strength of the report we'd, um, we'd written and, and changed the uh, story that he was giving as to how the bare footprint had got there. And that was a, that was a fairly key point in the whole trial which the, the police were very pleased about. So that was a typical bare footprint case we're involved in. So uh, 
the defendant changed his story in trial. In other words, you presented that evidence in the, in in your courtroom in the trial. Yes, that's yeah. right. Um, we presented that, um, and then he went on the stand himself um, at some point during the yeah. trial soon afterwards. And at that point, he then admitted it was his footprint. Well, I, I, I want to. I want you to respond. I listened to the, the words you used when you said there was a strong, Mo what was moderately, it? Strong, yes. moderately strong, yeah, uh, support for the proposition um, that he what could. Is, what is what is a moderately strong proposition that it was his foot? I mean, they, they let you say that in the courtroom. Yes, I mean o over here, um, uh, you know, we're quite keen on the likelihood ratio approach to um, uh, to presenting the strength of evidence, and for us as podiatrists, it does work um, very well indeed. You know, it allows us to express uh, or to consider and build in the uncertainties as as well as the certainties. Mm -hmm. So, with the features we're looking at, there moderately strong um, essentially means um, that there is a likelihood ratio. Of between um, a hundred and a thousand, um, uh, that um, that that this person had created uh, the prints at the scene of crime, and that was based on uh, considerations of, of of various features that that we recognise as podiatrists from um, the exemplar prints he created, and th seeing those same features in the print at the crime scene. How how exactly do you? Empiricalize that that data. Like, how do you put numbers into like a physical asset, like a day, like a footprint? You know what I mean? How do you make that? Do um, you, you understand what I'm asking? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, so for example, um, the overall length of the footprint in this case um, was um, uh, was used. Uh, we knew from the overall length of the footprint that it would represent a foot of a particular length. And then we could go into the national data tables that are available over here and say, well, we know that's 14% of the population mm -hmm. will have a foot uh, of this length. And then we could also uh, consider the ball width foot length ratio of the print, which um, is a variable that isn't re uh, doesn't reflect the overall length of the foot at all. And we have a collection of bare footprints we're able to use. We have our own um, experiences we can bring into this. We knew that um, that was around, I can't know, was it about 3% of the population, I think we'd said, would have a foot of that same uh, ball width yeah. length ratio. It was quite an unusually long, yeah, narrow foot. Very long, narrow foot in, in, yeah. in essence. So, so looking um, at the bell shaped curve distribution of foot yes. proportions, it was lying to one side yeah. of the bell shaped curve. And then we're also yeah. able to bring in this uh, toe formula that I mentioned earlier, uh, the order that we would meet the toes if approaching them distally. And in this case, um, he had an yeah, unusually yeah. long second toe, right. um, which, uh, again, we've got survey data that we could use to say what proportion of our population over here would have an unusually long second toe. And again, that's an, an another independent variable. Right. I do want to say I, I think that this is interesting because... Uh, this is actually information that I'm learning in class, you know what I mean? Uh, oh, yeah. Interpreting uh, yeah. empirical data and understanding how to, you know, analyze it. So, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. it's based on the work of uh, Ian Evert. Um, so, you'll look up his yeah. publications. Yeah. Um, and it's been adopted, yeah. you know, widely in forensic practice in the UK and through ENSFI, you know, the new Euro European network of forensic science yeah. institutes. Well, for our purposes, we use a very, very basic form. We're, we're very simple people, and we like to keep it as simple as possible. Okay. Let me. I, I want to go back again. I want to go back to your case. All right. Was there any? Uh, was this a barefoot uh, uh, that we were talking about at the crime scene? Yes. Okay. Were there any individual characteristics, uh, you know, calluses, uh, diseased skin, uh, or ridge, any minutia that no, was no, present? It was, um, the, the footprint was discovered when the carpet had been treated yes. with luminol and, mm. um, you know, photographed, mm. you know, with the luminol fluorescing. So you could see the overall yeah. shape, but there was no you know, fine enough detail to have used any of the techniques such as um, the ridge detail analysis and, that would have been individualized. And from memory, and yeah. it was quite a while ago now, I believe it was a SOC 
footprint as well that we were dealing with. So uh, we couldn't pick any any individual characteristics like that up at all. <clears throat> okay, very good. Jeremy, uh, how about a case? I'm very interested in the gate. You know, there's a lot, yes. you know, you, you probably noticed, uh, at least in America, a lot of people, especially police officers, in the performance of their duty are being recorded uh, all the time. And, you know, there's questions on where people were and how they got from point A to point B and, um, and whether a certain, you know, no matter how expensive the camera is and the surveillance camera is, it's never giving you a nice clear picture. Uh, nope. That you you know for for personal identification, so I'm very interested in in gait analysis. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about maybe a, a case where where gait analysis became very important? Yes, we had a, a case of a missing schoolgirl in um, you know quite local to where Wesley lives in Derbyshire in in the UK, and um, it was a, a young girl who lived in residential care. And had gone, you know, been to school one day and then hadn't turned up the next. They'd, they'd gone missing, and the police had two potential leads. One was a sighting of a girl in the same school uniform as the missing girl, um, walking about on the local railway platform and catching a train to Manchester. And they didn't know whether this was the girl, um, you know, choosing to run away and board a train and, and head off to Manchester. The other set of evidence they had was um, girls clothing um, discarded down a country lane with there was some shoes discarded and footwear and they'd found that the clothing had um, semen stains on it so the police were concerned that you know and this was very close to where the uh, young girl was living in care they were concerned that this might um, give them an idea that there'd been you know perhaps a sexual assault and an abduction there um, so they asked us to look at both the CCTV footage from the railway station with some footage they had you know known to be of the missing girl and also look at the footwear that was found with the clothing and footwear they recovered from the girls bedroom to see if there was any way we could suggest whether the link was with the clothing and footwear or whether the link was with the gait analysis from the uh, from the person walking on the railway station platform, and you know, cutting a long story short, the the surveillance footage they had of the of the girl that had you know she'd been to a one of the school events that had had CCTV footage there, and there's quite extensive footage of the girl walking, and the missing girl walked with her feet you know, pointing inward slightly, slightly adducted foot position as she walked, and she had a very narrow base of gait with the feet almost coming in line with each other. The footage of the girl on the railway station had quite a different walking style. You know, she walked with quite a wide base of gait for a female, and from memory I think the, you know, the slightly child, you know, they yeah. were slightly turned out, so it's quite, quite different gait features. Also the, you know, the, uh, school child walking on the railway station had quite a lot of sway in a gait so if she took each step you could see her shoulders swaying from side to side quite noticeably whereas the missing girl um, you know her shoulders stayed quite stable during the walking and her feet like I say were placed very much one in front of the other so our evidence was to say it was unlikely to be her boarding the train to Manchester but with um, information we took from the footwear, from the foot impressions inside the footwear, and some unusual wear features on the outsole, is that she she wore away the outer back of the shoe um, almost straight across, whereas more typically you'd be wearing across at an angle on the outer edge. You know, most people wear you know the outer rear edge of the heel area. She wore the you know absolutely straight line across the back and at a very steep angle so it was as though against a, a grinder and ground off the back mm. of the shoe to about 45 degrees which was quite an unusual wear feature but it was common mm. with the shoes with the missing clothes with the clothing and the uh, shoes recovered from the uh, from the girl's bedroom but that one yeah so <coughs> yeah, the police were originally very downhearted because it looked like it was more likely to be quite a serious abduction and perhaps a sexual assault situation 
not the girl choosing to yeah. uh, to head off into the big we city. We were able to say it wasn't her getting yeah. on the train, yeah. uh, but it really did look like it was her shoes. Yeah, and then the the story unfolded one or two weeks later um, that the you know the girl was found um, in a local McDonald's. She'd been spotted by one of her schoolmates, um, and she'd started a new life, uh, pretending to be a, a trainee solicitor, and was engaged to a to a young man. Um, and she was escaping the care system by pretending to be in her early 20s and starting a new life. And she'd used her clothing and footwear to lay a false trail to stop the police being able to find her in her new life. Son of a gun. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, this is fascinating to me. So, uh, based on what you just said, uh, again, I want, to, I want to learn some of this. It, when somebody says they had a narrow gate, that yeah. means that they're almost they're almost walking like this. I mean, um, yeah. one foot yeah. in front of the other. Yeah, the the base of gate would be if you looked, you know, um, from behind or in front of a, a person walking, you know, directly away from you. It's you know, in consecutive steps, how far apart were the feet from each other? And so that's something it like stands, Wesley mentioned, yeah. you know, in in, in the stance, <coughs> obviously in the stance part of the of the gate cycles, so when the foot is in stance on the ground, you know, how far apart are the, you know, and some people, you know, females tend to walk with a narrower base of gait than males generally, but there is some, you know, variation within men and women, you know, as to the base of gait, and that's something like men, Wesley mentioned earlier, that we can pick, pick up from footprint sequencing by looking at a series of prints and knowing the spatial relation of the prints to each other, you know, what was the base of gait and what was the angle of gait, you know, how much of the feet turned out or pointing forwards or turned in. So, uh, generally, women's, sho women's shoes are quite different than men's shoes, but there's certain boots and uh, there's certain shoes are, are uh, I would say, sneakers or running shoes can be very similar. So, yes. um, can you give an opinion when you look at sh um, uh, shoe prints, um, off footprints, uh, whether it was a male or female? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, we, we, yeah, I, 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 I suppose not with any degree of certainty. Not with any degree of certainty. I, I suppose no. in, 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 in terms of sort of profiling and having um, almost not an informed guess, but yeah, more likely to be yeah, female. It may be suggestive of, but yeah. nothing I'd yeah. like to um, yeah. hang a strong evidential hat on to. Um, you know, we, we know the feet are, um, you know, tend to be of different sizes, although again there's some overlap. Yeah. Uh, we know there are you know slightly different characteristics between men and women's feet, although there's a again there's an overlap. Um, but you know, that's right towards the bottom of the evidential scale, really. Yeah, because um, the, the, there's some men with a narrow base of gait and small feet. There's some women with a yeah. wide base of gait and larger feet. So, mm. you know, mm. there is some overlap, but yeah. though the trends would... Yeah, I mean, I think it's fair yeah. to say yeah. in our bare footprint collection, uh, we have some footprints that kind of challenge anybody to tell the difference. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, was this made by a man or a woman? On the other hand, we, 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 we've got some that you'd say, I'd be pretty confident to say that's from a man, uh, just based on its size and proportions, and others would say you'd be pretty confident saying it's uh, from a woman, but um, there are a lot of variables to consider, and it does get into a grey area in places. Very good. Let's talk about the profession, the profession, uh, the, uh, podiatry as the profession. Um, now, in the United States, I I thought or assumed that a podiatrist is a med is a physician who specializes um, in yes feet. Yeah. Feet. That's feet. correct. Yeah. 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 All right. <laughs> and um, are there now? In the, let's talk about United States for one one second, and then we'll talk about England. But um, are there people who get it? Can you get an undergraduate degree in podiatry? In America, um, the podiatrists do the um, the doctorate in podiatric medicine. So that's uh, that's the qualification they have. They are doctors in podiatric medicine in the United States. Um, you know, they're highly highly qualified physicians. Okay. Now, in England, it appears to be different. Yes. Yeah, very different. Um, in England, uh, most podiatrists will do a, a, an honours degree. Um, 
um, which would uh, would take three years, um, and then um, after they've worked in in typically worked in, um, in in generic areas of practice, uh, they would th most podiatrists would then specialise. Um, uh, they may specialise in foot surgery, um, and when they finish the surgery training, that's more or less all they would do um, throughout their working week, surgery of the foot. Um, others specialise in podiatric biomechanics, um, um, the, the movement of the foot and lower limb and the sort of problems that can create. Others will specialise in uh, footwear issues, uh, diabetes management of the high-risk foot. So it's... Um, yeah, they're quite different setups, but I think ultimately we end up in more or less the same place. <laughs> uh. All right, now uh, the the initials after your name, uh, uh, Dr. Vernon, is OBE. What does that stand for? Oh, well, that's uh, yeah, probably nothing to do with pediatric training. That's uh, officer of the order of the British Empire. It's um, oh, okay, all right. It's, uh, part of our honours system over here. Mm. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Um, you know, a lot of our viewers are students. Um, you know, high school students who are trying to decide what they want to be when they grow up. And uh, of course, they hear the word forensic science, and right away they say, "I think that's where I want to go." Um, in in what this show is all about is is introducing various you know areas of expertise. Um, if if somebody were you know, in America, you're saying if anybody was interested in this area, they would have to go to medical school first, correct? Correct. Um, however, I probably would would qualify that by saying there are certain areas of forensic podiatry, particularly the forensic gait analysis, um, that other disciplines uh, can achieve that same knowledge in different ways. So, for example, a member of our team. Um, is a um, uh, really a biomedical scientist. He's, he's a human movement specialist. He's not a podiatrist, but he teaches podiatrists um, all, all about um, human movement. Um, so, but but for forensic podiatry practice in its generic sense, we would say um, um, the most obvious way of achieving that knowledge yeah. is to quali 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 initially qualify as a podiatrist. And I think the other thing to mention, yeah. Tom, for students out there mm -hmm. that are thinking about a career in forensics is, of all the people I've met in forensics, um, most do um, a, a degree in a specialty first and then go on to, to further specialise in forensics. In the UK, a lot of universities are starting offering first degrees in forensic science and study forensics more generally and you know you, a lot of young students are thinking that's the route into forensic practice rather than realizing no it's the more traditional degrees in biology chemistry etc that um, you know the typical forensic experts start mm -hmm. off in and then they move their specialist exp expertise from their first degree into the forensic arena later on I think a lot yeah. of the general courses in forensics are very popular but don't necessarily lead to careers and I don't know if you have a, a similar issue in the States with universities cashing in on the popularity of forensics and putting on general forensic courses. At your app, you didn't say that. Yeah. <laughs> you couldn't have said it any better, Jerome. Uh, you know, <laughs> It's only been re it's only been recent that here in America that we even had undergraduate programs in forensic science. But you know, when you say you, know, you got a program in forensic science, what are you really saying? I mean, you got you got a you either have a program in science or you have a, a program in in le uh, law or criminal justice. I have students here at Maryland University of Maryland. I don't know how much you know about our university. We have thirty five thousand students. The big university. It's right outside of Washington D.C. and um, we have a one of the best criminal justice programs, which is where I teach, and of course I have to say that. Um, uh, I, we do, but we also have wonderful science programs. So when I have students, high school kids come in to me and say, "Hey, I want to go to Maryland, but they don't have a forensics program." Because see, my course that I teach in forensic science is within the, within the criminal justice program, and I say, "Look at you don't need that. You you what you can do is you want a double major." Uh, you can major in criminal justice and whatever science you're interested in, biology, chemistry, microbiology, whatever the case may be. Or you can just major in the science and then 
when yeah. you have to take your non-major uh, credits, you can take individual courses mm -hmm. in criminal justice because all you need to do is you need to understand the science and you need to know how it's applied to the legal system. Exactly. Just yeah. like I, yeah. I teach my criminal justice students to understand how science applies to the legal system. We go both ways, you know. Yeah, think, to think, me, you need to you need yeah. to understand both aspects and realize that you do need both. You need yeah. your specialist knowledge, and yeah. you need to understand how to safely apply that into a yeah. forensic context. Yeah, yeah, I think it's fair to say that it is it is changing. Yeah, and 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 there are some extremely good forensic science courses over here. Uh, you know, there's a number that the Chartered Society of Forensic Sciences, for example, um, you know, assess and 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 um, and validate from 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 their particular perspective. But what Jeremy's talked about is certainly the the traditional way of going about yeah. it, and the same applies to forensic podiatrists. Learn your own discipline first, and then learn how to apply that in a forensic context. Well, that's you know, I have three full-size crime scenes. Which are when a student takes my course, they get assigned to one of the crime scenes, and they work that crime scene throughout the semester. And mm -hmm. I'm just listening to you, and I'm I got one one of the three crime scenes. I need to add some more more challenges to them. And oh. guess guess what they're going to have next semester? I I just have this <laughs> feeling that they're going to be examining certain some because this is a rape case where this guy sneaks in yeah. his room and rapes this girl. And uh, so I have a feeling have they're going to be examining feet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I should have him keep his socks on next time yeah. so they can't just yeah. detail. That's, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. And that's right. Be in the as well. Yeah. yeah. And, and well, the listen, is is when yeah. there's footnote marks. Have, have the um, accused, um, you know, denying that they were wearing the shoes. You know, mm -hmm. so it's not just the shoe that needs to be linked to the scene. It's the person that needs to be linked in the shoes as well. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, I'm looking yeah. at the time and our hour is almost up. Do you have any words uh, to, for the practitioners, the, the police officers, the evidence technicians, the people? Um, what should they be doing, um, especially if they don't have close availability of a forensic podiatrist? Uh, so in America, because you're a member of the IAI, uh, yeah. if I'm a police investigator in some area of the United States and uh, I listen to the show and say, oh, hey, you know, I think a forensic podiatrist may help me. Where does that person go? To the IAI? Uh, I would say absolutely, yes, that's a good start. Um, I think I think the whole danger, the, 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 the mm -hmm. problem with forensic podiatry, and we, you talked about the CSI effect earlier, um, to the average clinical podiatrist, as soon as you put that F word in front of the word podiatrist, forensics, everybody gets excited by it. So I think the first thing is an, an awareness mm -hmm. that forensic podiatry is a discipline in its own right. Uh, you need to have, to have approached it in the right way. And rather than going along to your local podiatrist, who will no doubt be flattered and 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 really excited about the possibility of helping out, uh, they will not have enough contextual knowledge um, to work as a forensic podiatrist. So approaching the AI would be, um, um, you know, an extremely good starting point. Um, and we could certainly, you know, recommend who they ought to be approaching in in which part of the country they live. Wes and Jeremy, listen, our, our time is up, and, I, and I've, I've totally enjoyed this. You know, uh, I've been in this business for 40-plus years, and uh, I love when I'm learning new things, uh, and there's so many things out there, and this has truly been fascinating to me. And not only, uh, hopefully, will be, was it fascinating for the, the, those who may have watched this live, but uh, within five minutes after we're done, this show will be archived on our our YouTube channel for people to come back to at any time. Uh, so I want to thank you. I want to ask you, don't leave uh, uh, until um, we go off the air because I, I just want to uh, talk to you for a couple of minutes. So I'd like you to stay there for a moment. Uh, yeah. And again, um, thank you so much uh, for being with us. Uh, it's been it's been great. Ladies yeah. and gentlemen, you have been listening to the ForensicWeek.com show and with special guests, um, Dr. Wesley Vernon and uh, uh, Jeremy Walker coming to us from uh, England live, and uh, it was a great show. Uh, I do want to let you know that this is the last show for this year, 2014. 
uh, we tend to the show tends to work with the uh, with the semesters because I get a lot of my uh, assistants and uh, my my producers etc. Uh, from students like uh, Jamal who uh, as soon as the semester ends you don't see them for a while. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Uh, we're going to we're going to take the next few weeks off uh, while we're in the fall spring semester break. Um, the next scheduled show uh, isn't until uh, January 29th uh, when we're going to be uh, are featuring forensic interviewing in child abuse cases. We have a panel of guests, uh, Dr. Quanda Stevenson from Athens State University in Alabama who's been with us several times. She's assistant professor and program director of their criminal justice program um, and uh, she's been involved in the child advocacy studies training program called CAST. We also will have Claire Jones who's an attorney, former deputy district attorney for Limestone County, Alabama. Specifically, she works with uh, she has worked with representing abused children, investigation and trial uh, processes for these type cases. She's a board member of the Child Advocacy Center. Uh, she'll be with us, and Susan McGrady, uh, director of the uh, Child Advocacy Center in uh, Limestone County, will uh, be with us. And uh, um, Masha Milliken, uh, who serves as the executive director of the Minnesota Children's Alliance. So we're going to be talking about how we approach children and how do we interview them to uh, get the information we need that can be as clear and understandable for them as well as clear and understandable for us. Ladies and gentlemen, um, again, I want to thank our guests. I want to thank uh, Jamal Francis, who was our, uh, um, our producer today, uh, Laura Pachuki, um, um, uh, with, works during the day, so uh, that's why she's not with us. But I want to thank her for uh, for being our, our our producer for um, almost two years now. And uh, Jeremy, uh, excuse me, um, Jamal is going to be with us for an, another semester. So I appreciate that. Friendsweek.com is being brought to you through the cooperation of the Hangout10.com Live TV Show Network. We recommend that you go to the Hangout10.com website and see the schedule of other shows available for you to learn and be entertained. Meanwhile, I want to thank you for watching the show. I uh, hope all of you have a wonderful holiday and a pleasant and exciting new year. You have been watching ForensicWeek.com. Thank you. I'm your host, Tom Mariello, coming to you from Laurel, Maryland. CEO of Forensic IQ Incorporated and professor at the University of Maryland Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice in College Park. Our mission is to present real forensic related content by real forensic professionals and we go worldwide to find those professionals. Our goal is to broadcast topics of interest valued by an international viewership. Our vision, well informed practitioners, mentored students, in enlightened jury pools.